I am afraid. Oh, I am so afraid. The cold black fear is touching me tonight. As long ago when they would take the light and leave the little child who would have prayed, frozen and sleepless at the thought of death. My heart that beats too fast will rest too soon. I shall not know if it be night or noon, yet shall I struggle in the dark for breath. The poem Fear by Sarah Teasdale, an American poet. It is Halloween. We have with us here on this panel some distinguished horror experts to show us how to put a shiver in the spine of our players, how to scrape our fingernails across the blackboard of gaming. We have with us Peter Nello, designer of Cult Divinity Lost, the game that updates the 90s horror classic to the modern powered by the apocalypse world engine. Uh, we have Mike Mason, co-designer of probably the most prominent horror game on the market, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, he is co-designer of the seventh edition, and he is the designer of the Call of Cthulhu starter set. And we have horror novelist and YouTube horror expert, Seth Skarkowski. Gentlemen, welcome. Storm clouds gather. What, in your opinions, makes something horror? What's the difference between horror gaming and regular gaming? Uh, is it more than just subject matter? Are there key themes that we would like to go? I'm going to go in clockwise order as you appear on my screen for now, which is uh, Petter, you're, you're, you're first. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I would say that any kind of genre mostly most genres can become horror and you can play a horror fantasy game so it's not a setting as such but i would say it has to do with the atmosphere the situations and like the feeling of exposures for the for the player characters and uh, sometimes exploring of certain themes but horror can be so so big and so wide and so personal or just so gory so i would say it comes down to the atmosphere if you have the wrong kind of atmosphere I wouldn't say it's horror. So what 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 would mark out that atmosphere for you, Mike? Um, <clears throat> I think um, like love and hate, horror is a universal emotion. It can fit any time and anywhere, given the right circumstances. So in terms of atmosphere, I think um, there's the kind of the, the 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 obvious kind of you know we can set the scene with the you know the smoky misty moors or the 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 the, the dark building or whatever um, but I, I don't think that I think that's too simple I think that's that's too generic it's too horror the reason why horror is horror is that when it strikes it's horrifying and so it can happen at any any point and anywhere what it what it is is the reaction in the person being horrified if they're if they're horrified by the by the scene or the event um and so the 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 atmosphere i think we can work too hard to try and make a horror atmosphere that isn't our atmosphere at all you know we we light the candles dim the lights that may help um it might get us in the mood but that isn't going to create any horror we're just setting a scene um the horror is 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 in what you portray and what you share as a as a story um and and i guess that's the key word is a story um horror doesn't happen in isolation it, it's very you know you, you might get a jump scare in the middle of a, a fantasy game or, or something else but horror is about story the more story there is the more likely you are to be horrified because it has a meaning so horror has to kind of have a meaning Otherwise, it's just a jump scare. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Seth, that seems to lead nicely, nicely onto you as a, as a novelist as well as a, as well as a gamer. Um, the story aspects of, of horror, the, the build-up. Um, do you care to give us your uh, view? Well, for 
as far as what makes horror for me is a, is a feeling of outmatched. Uh, the 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 threat is actually a, a, a threat. Um, so I I would like a bit of a helpless feeling. Uh, for me, that's the big difference between the movie Alien and Aliens. You know, in Aliens. They they go in they're rocking and rolling they got all this this weaponry while in the first one it's some space truckers that have a homemade flamethrower and they have no idea what's going on both of them have claustrophobic and both of them have the science fiction one of them's got a whole lot more but it's uh, it's more like a D and D game it's a lot of combat and action and oorah while the other is this very isolated we're in the middle of nowhere we're underarmed, we don't know what we're going up against. And it's that mystery and helplessness that to me really makes a horror game uh, much more than a bug-eyed monster. So how would we go about building this uh, in, a, in a game? Um, Mike, you mentioned that, you, that sort of the, the venue where you're playing is not necessarily the important part. Do you do? Do you do you ever do the sort of the light dimming and the speaking with a dark voice in a Charles Gray sort of an accent? <laughs> I mean, um, I, I mean, I have done. You know, I've, I've tried it all ways possible. To be honest, in playing games like Call of Cthulhu for you know thirty plus years, um, I have tried it all. Um, now nowadays, I just maybe dim the lights slightly, but if I dim them too much, people can't actually read their character sheet, so it doesn't actually help, and that becomes a problem. So I just have the lights on so we can see, maybe not really total brightness, um, but um, I, yeah, you know, I, I you know, I'm play, I'm role playing, so I will portray characters, and I will put a voice on now and again, and I will, you know, because I mean that's part of the the toolkit of the. The GM, the keeper, you know the the, you know the pace, the pace and tone of your voice, the way you relay information, the way you describe the scene, all helps to build the tone, set the tone, and build the atmosphere. So all of those are ingredients in the mix that you can use, um, to, you know, to lesser or greater degrees. Certainly, um, yeah. Peta, you've nicely got an atmospheric setting for your for your video with a nice bit of uplighting going on there. Do you do you tend to use uh, venue atmosphere? I have, but normally not. Our our atmosphere, uh, you know, back when we used to be able to play in person before the horror of this year, uh, was a, a lot of chips and sodas and bright lighting and yeah just a standard bunch of friends hanging out so uh yeah i have done the the dimming of the lights and and all of that but and, and i think if sparingly used for special events that is perfect uh I, I think if that becomes the regular thing it loses its effectiveness but uh normally it's just, I, I think if you were just to take a photograph of us playing a horror versus us playing anything else, it would probably look exactly the same. It's just a bunch of friends hanging out and laughing. So better. Well, um, I I uh, I think atmosphere is important. When I spoke about atmosphere in the beginning, I was mostly in thinking about in the setting in the game. Uh, yeah. So I agree with Mike how you tell the story. I agree when you are you know dimming the lights too much you can't see the character sheets it just becomes confusing but i for me the atmosphere is really about i like to have music like this dark ambient soundtrack or these soundscapes that sort of let you sort of be drawn into it but i think the most important part is to have a good communication with the players that like we are playing horror we are playing cult now so let's keep focus what is important and just have this round of discussion like we sort of all buy in that everyone is part of building the atmosphere that said of course we are having fun times joking as well but i think that when you go, go goes to these scenes that becomes very intense and especially very personal if someone then cracks a joke it can sort of ruin it so so to have the players invested just as much as i am in building the atmosphere and just have that discussion. How should we do it? Uh, I think that helps immensely. 
I, I, I am surprised of myself that I didn't think about just communicating that with the players before. So I just <laughs> realized, oh, I can talk to the players. When you when you started off with the right kind of atmosphere in a game, um, how do you ramp up the tension? I mean, the 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 one of the one of the hallmarks to me of of horror is that the the horror gets incrementally worse. The 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 feeling of uncertainty, the the fear. Um, it is, as, as, as Henry James would, uh, would put it, it is the turn of the screw, isn't it? Um, are there any particular techniques or, or advice that you might have about, about pacing? Um, uh, and I want, to, I want us to work up sort of slightly to, to the idea of a, of a big reveal, because I feel that very much what, what scares us is what we don't know. And as soon as you put the monster on the table, whether it be a, a human monster, an alien, a, an, an elder, um, an elder cre elder being, if you're playing Cthulhu, um, that that loses some of the magic and we sort of end up going a little bit to the tactical board game kind of thing. It might be that you're trying to run away, but sort of what, what sort of gauges do you have for steps of tension and how might you how might you crank it up Seth if we start with you this time um for me it is slowly taking away their uh basically their their friends or their resources you're basically you're trying to isolate them uh so you're either taking away their uh allies you know, either either killing them or getting rid of them or or having them leave, and you are kind of slowly taking away their network to get them more isolated, uh, away from all of the other things that they would normally be able to use uh, to either escape or overcome the enemy. So for me, I think it should be you're you're limiting uh, their their world smaller and smaller uh, is. Now, my idea for it. Peter? Well, I, I, I completely agree with Seth there, right? As you want to sort of isolate the players further and further. And um, for me, it's really about holding things back because I think that it tends to, the easiest thing is to over escalate things so that, you know, so I think effective horror, you are like holding the reins back. And especially if you have player characters on, in different scenes that you can cut between that when it becomes very intense in one scene you can really cut from that scene and go to the next one uh, with another character and then jump back because i think that you really want to drag out the horror and unknown and un uncanny aspects as long as you can and really play with the uncertainties uh, and, and the biggest mistake you do especially in the beginning i think that you go straight for the gore and straight for the monster and then it loses its power, I would say. Mike? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Seth and Beto have just said. Um, I think I would say a few things like um, a monster in itself isn't necessarily horrifying. It's the effect the monster has on the players or their characters or the environment that's horrifying. Just putting, you know, a deep one in front of you you know, yeah, okay, there's a sanity loss and all that kind of, we have that kind of in-game reaction. But in terms of the players, it's not actually scary in any way. But the, the, so what is scary is, as you said yourself, Andy, is the unknown. So if you can leave room for the unknown in your players' heads, which is what Pedro is describing by saying, you know, if you building up to a kind of a, a you know, a building up the suspense and tension by, um, you know, cross-cutting between the players and their situations, leaving each of those crosscuts on a almost like a cliff edge where there is room for the player to imagine the worst that is now going to happen to the character but you're delaying that by going to the next character and saying yeah well you're entering the room and there's something moving in the background what are you doing you think it's moving towards you then you cut to the next player leaving that player to think about what's moving in the room what am i going to do you let the you can't make things horrifying in a player's head the player has to do that so what your tools are, 
are, t- are you know are the tools of role playing in terms of GMing are describing and pacing the the information to leave room for the players to generate their own fear. Yeah, you can't. I can't tell you you're afraid because you will not. You'll not be afraid. But I can create the environment and the mood um, to hopefully encourage you to feel slightly afraid, at least for your character. Does that? that yes, kind of, that makes perfect sense, sense yeah? to me. What do you do about the players who sort of might approach this as they might approach? Uh, a D and D mission. Um, they don't split the party. Um, they attempt to make the logical, tactical, tactically optimized choices and use of their skills. Is that simply a question of saying, "Look, folks, get your head in the game um, and and play this game. Don't play D and D." Or is there is there something you can do to try and uh, try and bring this out and one of the reasons i'm asking this is because what we were saying earlier about horror is not a genre in itself or it it can be in many genres so i'm looking here at advice we might give somebody who's running a DD or a pathfinder game and wants to inject some horror into that session um i forgot We've been around. We've started with everybody once, and I can't remember where we are now. So um, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not going to roll a dice. Um, I'll start with Seth this time. Just pick at random for me. Um, so if if we were to do horror in, let's say, Dungeons and Dragons or a a a, a combat based game, uh, the big things that that I recommend is the all of their tactical optimizations and all of that are not helpful that's that's where it happens you make it you make it clear that all that cool stuff that they can do that makes them walk around feeling like the the, the toughest heroes that ever lived that is meaningless because then you give them that feeling of helplessness um and and monsters you know dungeons and dragons pathfinder they've all got big scary monsters with sharp fangs and that drool give them something that doesn't feel right you know, describe the way it moves in a, a strange way if a uh if, if a scraggly haired woman emaciated comes crawling up to you and she opens her mouth and she snarls we expect that but if she giggles like a little girl and that's not what you're expecting at that moment to me that's actually where the horror comes from is it is not predictable um and it's a a sense of wrongness to it so if they're helpless and what they're facing has a sense of wrongness you can still get horror from it mike i'm gonna go reverse clockwork order for for me now and i'm I'm see my fingers going there Going the opposite way to the way I mean. I haven't got anything mirrored or something. <laughs> well, <laughs> so pretty much said exactly what I would say. Uh, uh, in that, um, with a with a with a game, um, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, which is you know as either combat orientated or that has a very kind of fairly rigid kind of play structure. You know, the players know who they are, their characters are. They know what their abilities can do. They know the best combinations. Um, they know that uh, uh, a goblin is not as powerful as a giant or whatever it may be. They know all these things. So you've, as, you know, as Steph said, you've got, you've got to make them uncomfortable. You've got to pull the rug from underneath them. You've got to change the dynamic and you've got to make it, you know, by making things weird, making things that don't make sense, by having when the wizard casts fireball, um, you know, all the villagers start bleeding blood out of their eyes instead, because that will freak them out. And things like that, you've got to change the dynamics, change the rules of the game, basically, not not the mechanical rules, but the world rules. So they suddenly, as as as, as been said, you know, they, they feel isolated. They they can't comprehend why this shouldn't is work. You know, why things aren't working the way they should, because that again leaves that part in their heads of like i don't understand if i don't understand something then i have the potential to fear it mm. better well i think we have had two really good points and I, I i perfectly agree with them i i think that system does matter and some systems are 
better for horror, of course. I mean, I feel a more sense of horror and that my character is fragile when I'm playing Call of Cthulhu or when I'm when I when I'm a 10th level fighter in Dungeons and Dragons, it's like yeah, I'm not afraid of that many things. <laughs> um I think that Dungeons and Dragons have experimented with horror with the Ravenloft setting and did quite smart things with madness and that you were transforming into the monster yourself. When it comes to splitting the party again, I think that's it's all about what the story is. If it's Cthulhu, it's and you are the classic investigators. I think that normally you have your troop going together because everything is so dangerous and will kill you. Um, Cthulhu is, of course, a very broad game, so you can do many things, but the classic campaigns. Um, but but I think that otherwise, just if you want to have these more personal, isolated horror. It's all about talking to the players and also see so that story goes out into different directions where players are separated naturally and not like forcefully. Um, and even if you have like this, this, this party that is Dungeons and Dragons, so just to isolate one of the characters, perhaps the one that is most bold and brash, let him fall, fall into the, the tunnels below, lose his weapon in the darkness and hear things and like have nothing to support him. I think that can be quite efficient if you want to sort of experiment with that. But I, I think it's mostly best to be clear. So because I think that the worst thing is to have a group of players that expects to place one thing, and then they feel they are sort of forced to play something else. Um, and then I think it sort of can become very frustrating on both ends. I'm sort of building a picture in my mind, or well, not building a picture. Peter Jackson has built a picture in my mind um, when we're talking about building up the atmosphere in a D and D type game, and it is just quite simply drums, drums in the dark. They are coming, and then the overwhelming force, and ultimately the Balrog. Um, which is, I think, as close as Lord of the Rings gets to gets to horror I, I i i just want to disagree that i think that when you have four hobbits running through the woods hunted by nas schools i i, I think that's that's actually <laughs> yes. a step worse but i think you've identified the key point though with, with a game with a with many fantasy style games in that the horror is is from meeting something that clearly is more powerful than you because the whole game is about acquiring power so you are the biggest and the best and and so when you meet, you know, the Balrog or whatever, which is clearly, you know, bigger than better and harder than you, there's a certain fear that you're going to lose your character. I think D and D tends to work on the fear of losing your character because you've spent so much time investing in it. Um, I think there are, you know, uh, as Pella says, you know, different systems obviously play to different strengths in this way, um, and certainly kind of games that are, you know, horror games. Um, yes, there is the kind of sense you can lose your character, but often there's a there's often more at stake as well. It could be the the entire world in Cthulhu, uh, but you know you are the only people that are going to be able to do anything about you know saving saving humanity and civilization or whatever. That might be a you know a component within the game. Um, it may be you know saving your reality in a different game or whatever it may be. But the stakes the stakes often are in a horror game. They they are personal, but they are also often broader um, than just you know the fear of losing your player character. So we've both, um, both Petra and Mike, you've, you've both mentioned um, mechanics supporting horror. And uh, of course, Call of Cthulhu famously has the, um, the sanity um, characteristic um, and, and the slow loss of sanity is, is both a, a horror mechanic on its own and very in keeping with the with the style of horror that you're trying to emulate, um, the, the the eldritch horror, the uh, Cthulhu mythos of of H.P. Lovecraft. One of the things that I really like in that is that the more that you learn about the Cthulhu mythos, it it limits how sane you can be. Um, and I don't think it's a it, no, it's not necessarily a very very massive limit. But the fact that every percent that you go up in your understanding of the mythos drops your sanity maximum by a percent um, is is a slow encroachment. So let's talk about some some mechanics um, that that might support horror. Mike, we've mentioned the sanity. Um, you've 
Yeah, obviously that I think originally was was Sandy Peterson's uh, idea. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to come to you last, but I'm going to ask you if if it wasn't for a sanity mechanic, if it wasn't for that core mechanic in in Call of Cthulhu, what's what's a really good mechanism? So I'm going to ask you to sort of think outside the box a little bit there, which is why I'm going to give you a bit of time. Um, Petter, you've you've taken the the um, setting for Colt and you've applied it to Apocalypse World Engine. Um, what are some of the mechanical changes that you've made in that game, um, which I'm mostly familiar with in, in Dungeon World um, and um, uh, Monster Hearts, um, and even the, the historical one, the, the Iceland one. Um, and it's always felt to me like a very, very narrative, very, very free form system, um what do you do to take that sort of you you succeed at a penalty and turn that into into horror well i think that the system that me and robin built from apocalypse world is 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 very i mean compared to old cult which was a 90s game where you had a lot of martial arts 100 different skills um you a lot of weapons and and Unlike Call of Cthulhu, it was more meant that you would meet the monster and then you would shoot it apart with your machine guns. Um, we we really went away from that. And, and I just think that the core system in, in Apocalypse World, where you have the role where you can get a, a, success, a success with complication, which is the most normal thing, and a complication. And the success with complication thing that you roll very seldom, but every role has a big impact to the story. And as a game master to have these complications to throw in that is part of the system tends to almost build the story itself um, and then uh, then I would say that a big part of the system in cult is of course that uh, the story is really about the characters when you build a campaign you establish their dark secrets and their story and you build the campaign around them so it's, it, it's really about the player characters and the whole system for building the campaign is just from the from the rules. So, so I would say that had sort of changed the game completely because earlier it was an idea, but there was no system to do that. So, so it both gameplay wise and and when you are sort of planning what kind of stories you are going to play out, and and having the players invested in that, saying, I want to be the the scientist that has performed illegal experiments. And another player wants to be the Avenger. And then we know that the story will be about the scientific experiments and about the vengeance and that the game master will build the story upon this. And I think that really makes it a different kind of game than the classic sort of horror stories and campaigns from the 90s. Seth, what do you feel? Mechanics that particularly support horror? Um, uh, my opinion is the the best mechanics to support horror is a a skill based game where there's not classes where you're not a, a fighter or wizard or rogue and you fit into this heroic archetype you are an accountant or an insurance salesman you are you are a, a person uh, that is in in a role and you can have that character um, that to me. Uh, you are less likely to just feel naturally as a player that you are heroic. You feel like a, a person, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a 10th level stock boy. Um, also the uh, skill-based systems usually, cause there's always exceptions have more of a sense of fragility to the characters uh, where it also does feel more real that if uh, a guy on the street pulls out a, a knife and says, give me your money. That knife is an actual threat uh, that could hurt your character. You can't just shrug it off and go, hey, you can stab me all day and I don't care. It is how you would feel in real life of, oh my God, I, this, is, this is bad for me. So that sense of fragility and not being the big archetypal hero and you're more of a character to me is the mechanics that I think make the best horror games. Mike, have you had sufficient time to, to come yeah, up with I, the curveball I threw you? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not about to design a new horror game for you on the spot, <laughs> but um, I will tell you what we did with 7th edition, which is a beyond the sanity mechanic. Um, apart from kind of codifying 
what sanity meant in game terms other than you know suggest to the character they they act in a funny way we tried to codify that with uh, things like bouts of madness and delusions which uh can be used as mechanical you know devices in the game to push the horror um and we kept when we when myself and paul uh fricker were designing the seventh edition system we kept saying the same phrase we kept saying pushing the horror and it kind of um stuck in our heads and so we we created the push roll so um which is basically you know have a second attempt at the skill roll you failed if you want but if you fail this second attempt because you're pushing it you're doing more you're committing more into trying to achieve success the very fact that you're committing more means this should you fail that role the consequences will be worse than simply you know failing and walking away you know you, you you're climbing up the mountainside and uh, you know you fail your role and you kind of get a few feet and you can't really find a handhold and so you kind of drop back down, you know, call it quits. Or you can push the roll and you can, you know, take a running jump at that mountainside, leap, leap beyond your grasp to try and get that foothold and handhold just, just above your reach. If you make it, you've got it and you can carry on scrambling up the side. But if you don't, you've, you've, you know, you've missed it. You've, you've fallen down. You've hurt yourself. You've done something worse has happened to you. So that kind of pushing the roll, you know, pushes the horror, basically, because in a game like Call of Duty, obviously the consequences are always going to be, you know, bad news for the players. And obviously that's a normally a, a, an horrific kind of thing. So those that's the kind of thing that we thought would, you know, not only aid gameplay and give player agency to some degree, but there's a consequence to it all. And that's obviously a lot of the time with horror gaming, it's a lot, it's a lot about consequences the consequences of your choices, the consequences of the roles you make, the consequences of the actions you take. Um, because in, in, in most other role-playing games, the consequences aren't kind of meaningless. You just didn't do it, and that's fine, we move on. But in a horror game, the consequences have more meaning. Because you fail to do that, the, the bad thing gets worse, or, or you allow something bad to happen to somebody else or yourself, because that's the nature of the horror of the game. So uh, consequences through the mechanics and obviously the narrative story um, can be that much, you know, are always that much worse than a horror game because it's a horror game. And I think one of the one of the things, and I'm not sure whether it was introduced in seventh edition or in a, in a slightly earlier edition. As I, as I was saying earlier, I jumped from very very early editions of Call of Cthulhu to the latest one. Um, but the other thing I really like um, with the skill system. Um, that I think helps helps build horror is the is the rule that you have that uh, if a player makes a role and succeeds, the player gets to say what happens, and if they make the role and fail, the GM gets to say what happens. And I I, I have to say that that that's that's just a little rule that it's not particularly a mechanical rule; it's a game style rule, and I've pinched that for my home games, whether it be rolling D20s, percentile dice or what have you, but I really, really enjoyed um, that mechanic. And I think when I've used it in, in Cthulhu, Invictus or in, in other games, what frightens the players more is if the, they fail the role and the GM lets them succeed. Yes, yeah. Um, it's like, what else is going to happen now? Um, which brings us back to that fear of the unknown, I think, again, and also the, the general fear of, of how mean is this Games Master. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we've spoken a lot about building the tension up to the big reveal, and actually we have a question in from, uh, from NASA on, on how to make the monster horrifying before the players get to see it. We have spoken about the unknown being there, but are there any particular tricks that you might use to sort of show a little bit or, or show a glimpse of, of what might be happening. I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking a little bit um, like the, the, the drool dripping down from the chains in Alien. We keep coming back to Alien and I, and I think with good reason. Um, is, is there anything that, that you know you might give a glimpse, you might give a hint what what way might you do that? And again, I've completely forgotten who we started off with last. Um, so I'll, at random, um, I'll pick Mike to start this time. 
Okay, well, the answer is yes. It's a really good idea to tease the monster in some way um, for the players because you're just putting it, you know, just opening the windows and there's a, a monster stood outside is, is not, you know, isn't going to scare anyone or make make that scene particularly effective unless the monster is like, you know, the size of the moon or something, then maybe that might shock them. But, um, but normally... Um, yeah, so that, you know, the, the the alien analogy is fantastic. Yeah, what we see is goo dripping down. We find, you know, we find, I don't know, I'm trying to get a film now, but, you know, you, we find, you know, or, or, or the thing, you know, we find um, blooded clothing or, or whatever, whatever clues that something wrong here. There's something wrong here and it looks like something is eating or taking people away is a good starting point. Um, and then you build that up to the slow reveal. I mean, in the um, Call of Cthulhu rule book, there's a, a section I write about, you know, character death, about there are many monsters in Call of Cthulhu that are are just going to gobble up the players really, really quickly. And and in a sense, that's that's no fun in the game. You want what you... That, and that the reason for that is that you, you want the monsters to create the fear and the players have a definite threat that they know they can be gobbled up. But you don't want to do it all in the first five minutes because that's going to end the game. So you want to stretch out the stretch out the horror and the fear and the fact that the you know that they they could well be doomed because that's you know that's all good atmosphere building. Um, and so in the section I say you know try and try and give players you know three warnings that they're about to face their inevitable doom. So you know I use the example of a, a cellar full of shoggoths in the book, where you know we, we give you know on the way on the way towards a cellar. We make sure they they hear something bad in the cellar, so they get a. There's an auditory clue. There's a slime trail leading down to the cellar, and then as they get to the door outside, there's scratch marks and the cellar doors covered in blood. Um, so all the clues are that whatever is behind that door is really bad. Do you really want to open the door? And so yeah, using those kind of um, a build up in some way to reveal, you know, a hint of the monster. You know whether that's a, a quick movement, a shadow, signs of what it's done before you actually reveal the monster in some way. And even when you reveal the monster, that's a whole other conversation. But you know what you actually say the monster look like looks like, and uh, how you describe it is is you know is important too. So we need we need Chekhov's gun, but in Call of Cthulhu, the creature may or may not be immune to gunfire. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, what's what's your views on that? Well, I, I think it's 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 uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's really good. Uh, in cult, you often have a more personal connection to the monsters, and just like Seth said, you 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 play characters that are like people that have like a home. A, not normally, of course, but it can be exceptions. But you have a home, you have jobs, you have relationships, you have a life, and depending on that kind of monsters, we we don't really. There are some, of course, monsters that just eat people, but this is more like demons and spirits and creatures and that kind of kind of more hellraisery stuff and and uh, so so the things are more like invading the player's life or sensations and and uh, but but the rule i would say still apply that you want to give the hints the and you can use some sort of you know it's always the smell of jasmine when the monster has been close when you come on home, you feel the smell of jasmine in your apartment and you have the feeling that someone has been there. And I think that depends on what kind of game you want to go with. When you want to go for the more gore and blood, you will have like lore, gore and blood and slime. And But you can also have the more subtle and more like the uncanny things that things have moved around. And why is your diary now open on your bed? And, you know, things like that. Mm. Seth. Uh, well, actually, to 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 build off that wonderful point, the smell. Um, in in writing, one of the most valuable lessons that that I ever got early on is we have five senses, and we focus too much when telling a story on on sight and sound. You've got two, you've got three other senses. Well, I can't even add right now. Uh, so if you if you give that that lingering smell and once again that sense of, of wrongness you've got a sense of jasmine well that's that shouldn't be a horror smell that's not what i was expecting versus the smell of blood or uh, a, a taste in the back of your throat give you you, you pull them in with the atmosphere um 
I think showing the results of what the villain or monster is capable of early on. Uh, and if you do show the villain or monster, then let them know that it has escalated since. Going back to Alien, because that's going to be the, the standard thing for the day. Early on, you see it, it, it explodes out of a guy's chest. It, it's, it's horrible and surprising and shocking. And then it runs away and you're like, oh my God, that's the most horrible thing. And, and 10 minutes later, it's eight feet tall. It has escalated now. So what we saw before the reveal of the monster is just still a tease of the thing to come of like, you, you thought this was bad. Now look at, you know, in the shadow, the silhouette on the wall, it just got worse. And so even though you could do a reveal, you know that that was still just a tease of how bad this is about to be. So that's my little addition to that. Now, I was going to ask now, so we've been talking quite a lot about what I would consider to be um, psychological horror. Um, really sort of the, the fear in the, in, in the, in the mind as opposed to something like a, a slasher film um, where we might use a lot of, a lot of um, jump scares, I suppose, you know, even, I, I mean, I've, done it in the past even to, even down to the gm shouting boo you know <laughs> um which is possibly the cheapest shot in the entire book of gm's tricks um but we've been talking about really about the slow burn but um nasa's come up with another question that i think is is um is worthwhile um d discussing um different genres um or different styles of horror. Would would you see a difference between running a gothic horror game, a, a slasher horror, and uh, and a cosmic horror? Um, uh, Peter. Oh, the answer is yes. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Now, no, would I, you care I, to I... expand <laughs> upon that answer a little? <laughs> I, the first rule I got in an interview: never ask a question that can be answered yes or no. So I failed that one. <laughs> Well, I, I, I can uh, elaborate perhaps on the, the gothic horror because there are really different types of stories depending on what you do because the gothic horror is the classic horror stories with isolation and, and, and madness. And I would say in those, you really want to have the right locations. Just going back to Alien, since this is the theme as <laughs> Seth has defined it, I would say that Alien is a, almost a perfect gothic horror. You have like you're landing on the planet, but and it's missed, and then you see the castle. Okay, it's an alien spaceship, and then you go back, and people become infected, and you're hunted in this labyrinth by these monsters. The, the only thing I think that is not gothic horror that the, the monster in gothic horror tends to have more personality. But I think that yes, uh, I, I different types of horror have different kinds of tropes. It expects different types of player characters, I would say, and, and the player investments of, of who are you portraying and what kind, are you just expendable? Is it a slasher? Are you like teenagers going out into the woods, uh, drinking, smoking weed and having sex, and there is a masked man hunting you? That's a, then you build a lot on sort of like the suspense and getting away from the murder, but it's perhaps not that much of personality. Uh, and Cosmic Horror, I will leave to Mike because I think that he will be the master of that aspect. That looks like a great segue onto you then, Mike. Yeah, I mean, Pat's absolutely right. I mean, within horror, there are, there are you know, there are certain agreed genres, as, as we've said, yeah, the slasher and the gothic and, and the, the, the survival horror and all, all the rest of it. And obviously you can cross mix them and subvert them and all that kind of thing. But it, it it will come down to um you know what what are you trying to create what is this, what is the story you're trying to tell around the gaming table and sometimes you know you sometimes you need to be up front with the players and, and kind of you know, let them kind of know that we're going to be playing a kind of a gothic style horror game rather than a, a, a friday the 13th game because that you want them in the right kind of headspace for that kind of you know their characters to act in the appropriate way almost um and in terms of the, you know, the cosmic horror is very much a kind of, you know, a lot of the things we've talked about, they're all about that kind of sense of insignificance, a sense of isolation, a sense of things happening beyond understanding or 
the uh, mon you know even if there is a monster it acting beyond beyond our rationalization it does it does strange things i don't understand why it did that that and because it did that it unnerves me because again there's a unknown quality to that um but the sense of that you know this obviously the sense of the cosmic and you know we we being a a small ant-like race and on a rock in the middle of nowhere kind of thing but um what, what i what i wanted to say was um that it, it's important to kind of understand what what is the shape of your game because that will help um are you playing a one shot one session horror film or are you playing a multi-part campaign because you're going to play those in very different ways because if you play a campaign like you play a horror film all your characters are going to be dead in the first session and you've not got a campaign so you need to think about what are you what am i running here what what is the purpose i'm trying to do if it's a campaign then i'm looking at how how do i build in horror in kind of bursts and you know trickle it through to build whereas a, a one shot horror film as i tend to call them i call them horror films is um well the first scene could be you know straight into it um so i think having an idea of the shape of the game that you want to play will help to inform you and obviously things like you know the gothic experience is pretty good for for a longer style game the the friday the 13th is clearly you know you can't really make a campaign that friday the 13th you could but it'd be hard uh you know it's a one-shot kind of game so think about what you're trying to achieve i think yeah i mean i'd, I'd... A one shot, I, w I certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't mind, and might even engineer so that it culminates in a TPK, um, which is not usually considered something that the GM should aim for in a game. Um, but again, with the as you say, with the Friday the Thirteenth, what you probably don't want to do, even in a one shot like that, is pick the players' characters off one by one. So you know, Jane over there has to sit for three hours with a dead character. Um, no, you've, you've got to make sure that if it's Friday the 13th, you have enough um, ready-made replacement characters because that's the, that's the whole fun of the game. It's that like you're all, you're all going to die. It's just how long, you know, how long can you keep one character together and can you be the final, you know, the final girl or bloke or whatever it is, you know, can you, or can you, you know, just completely win the day against an insurmountable odds. So you have this kind of, set of characters you can you know just throw in and, and say yeah you you were killed in the first scene you weren't expecting that were you here's another character right let's get on with it um that's what we used to do with early call of cthulhu editions always make sure you've got four or five characters in reserve <laughs> um seth what, what's your views on that the differences between sort of um gothic slasher psychological cosmic uh, well, I, I, I absolutely agree with, you know, tell your players beforehand what sort of mood that we're, we're going for. That way they walk in with the proper mindset to achieve that. Uh, if we're going to do a gothic versus a slasher, it, it, go ahead and tell them. Uh, now, sometimes it is fun to surprise them of, you know, we thought we were going to get this and, and now we got this, but that's more of a, a special treat. I think if they, if the players come in expecting this is what we're going to do, they will help accommodate that because the players want, they want it to, they know they're playing a horror game, so they want it to, to work. Uh, and also with the idea of the, the campaign versus one shot horror, uh, you absolutely approach those in, in the different way because if you do the, the long-term campaign, one, they need to know what that's going to be beforehand. They're going to behave differently. But you can pull in the different tropes and the different ways to really bring your point in. Because if you're doing a campaign, I don't, I'm not going to kill a PC early on. That's kind of a, a shock moment. And then say, okay, here's your new character and go on because I want them to keep that character and grow. Uh, and you know, if I was going to do my, my Friday the 13th slasher, that would, that would be a one shot. And I might 
take out a player character just for a dramatic moment very early on. And then it's like, okay, well now, you know, here's Ricky. You're going to play Ricky now to find out what happened to your last character. Uh, in a campaign, I would feel like a jerk if I did that because I want them to feel that survival is a possibility if we're going to try to carry this on for months and months and months. Um, so that's the different styles does depend on what type of game and what the long-term goal is. I have a question from Mohammed Al Khan. Um, would you play on the players' phobias? And if so, how? Now, it's very, I'm thinking he's specifically asked players rather than characters, because obviously with a character's phobia, we're going to want to bring that into the game in some way, shape or form, or, or why have it? Would you play on a player's phobia? Or is that unfair? I think that's a conversation with the player before you start the game, or the players. Uh, if, you, if you're thinking that that's what you might want to do, I would counsel that you have a conversation with your players to say whether that is acceptable to them. Um, because obviously, you know, we're all afraid of many different types of things and some, some things more than others. And, um, you know, it is a game, it is meant to be fun, uh, we're not, you know, while, while uh, you know, a, a little scare as a player is a healthy, fun thing like watching a horror film, we're not looking to psychologically scar the players when they go home. Um, so, um, you know, there is a conversation to be had. My, my, you know, if no, my stock response to anything like this is know your players and talk to your players. Um, and there are, you know, there are some groups that aren't going to want to go anywhere near that kind of thing. And they are good role players and their characters that they've rolled up have flaws and fears and stuff as characters. And the players are going to, you know, role play those as the game. And that's cool because that's what we're meant to do. Um, role, you know, uh, acting on a, a person's personal fears, that's a different matter and, uh, and as, as a bigger consequences. And so often, you know, I would advise you don't do that unless you as a group have all agreed that actually, yeah, I'm going to tell you that I'm afraid of spiders and I really don't mind if you have loads of spiders in this game. And, you know, because it will freak me out, but that's cool because that's what I'm happy to do. I think, you know, you that, have that's me exactly, by the way. That's that's one of my <laughs> phobias is spiders. And I love them in games. And people tend to walk on tenterhooks around me. I oh, better not have the giant spider in there. You know, I'm like, no, actually, I love that. It actually gives me that little creepy feeling. And I, and I want that. My other phobia is heights. And in a game, it has absolutely no effect on me. Um, I mean, I... I the first time I took an eagle jump in Assassin's Creed was was that had an effect on me. Um, Lord of the Rings, where they dive down the side of Orthanc, that, that had an effect on me. But in a game, nothing. But spiders, yeah, they give me that little ooh. And it's a nice ooh. Um, I think we might have answered that quite well enough. We're running out of time. And there is an interesting one um, from Michael Rupert. Um, do we consider that 2001, the movie, could be considered a horror film because it has elements of horror but no monster? I would argue there might, in fact, be a monster in that film. Um, Seth, I don't think we started with you for a while. I'm not sure, but I'm, I don't think. Um, yeah. I would say on a short answer, yes, you could do 2000, 2001 in a lot of ways could be considered a, a horror film. The, the monster is the, 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 the unknown. And there is that, 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 that cosmic horror. I mean, we've got these, you know, obelisks popping up. What's the other horror is how, you know, this, this thing we have made that we, we trusted to take care of us while we slept in these things could just, get rid of us and 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 we have become the instruments of our own demise by creating th th this um this tool that has now become our enemy and we are outmatched versus it uh, one of the one of the other things i would like to tell people the difference between fantasy or or science fiction in this case and horror is the lighting um, you can show the exact same subject in a different lighting and it completely skips into a different genre. 
Um, so if if you you can do it and it's pure sci-fi, or you can do it and it's sci-fi horror, just depending on how you light it. And so yes, two thousand one, that's a cosmic horror and also about our own hubris. The lighting is a really interesting point. Is there something that you could? Is it a way that you could sort of illustrate that? Um, idea of lighting in a in a tabletop game well it's it's the and presentation mean... <laughs> yeah uh, you know such as you could do a, a story of a, of a werewolf that's stalking a neighborhood and it could be done as an action comedy or it could be done as a horror but it's really just how you present it it, it could it could do the exact same actions but how you you build that up is is actually what makes it horrible having a monster is not horror what it does and how it's presented is horror petter mike do you have anything to add to that i i uh, i agree perfectly with with uh, set in that it's just how you frame it i just want to add a quick little note and what mike said about talking to your players and using phobias because i think that's a really important thing to do and that in cults cult is i would say very i it's very seldom i find that players are like i am afraid of spiders you can't use them but it's like ah, okay we perhaps shouldn't have the theme of suicide in our game because i've been part of something that's really troubling and you know so there's a part in when making a campaign we have a horror contract like what is okay what is not okay what do we want to have in the game uh, and that's i would say is a part and i think that the more psychological you go and the more there are about the characters and the more like it's less about a monster gobbling you up and less more about you are an actual person and the world is crumbling over you and you're perhaps going insane and you have realized oh i murdered my wife in my insanity that is something you want to talk about so the more closer you get to the personal the more you really need to communicate with the players so they are okay because few people will be like freaking out that they are eaten by a shogot but other subject matters that are closer to their own experiences you need to be more careful with yeah and i think that's that's that that's an excellent point that i would that i would say how do you how do you square um trying to give your players that sense of horror and um and they they um the diversity um and and comfort that we try and cultivate in our actual presence at the tabletop or whether it be virtual or whether it be real you know we want we want people to feel comfortable and and open and then yet we're going to try to scare them so what 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 would you recommend i mean lines and veils x cards are you going to be using you're going to be using consent methods um session zero um mike you were you were saying about talking to players earlier and yeah, that's, that's whatever, sort of very much a session works, zero, zero. Yeah, whatever works for your group. If your group wants to use an X card or lines and veils or, you know, uh, or just talk about it up front, whatever works, you know, not is not one solution to any of this, it's, but this, but there is, but the overarching solution is communication. Um, and as long as you communicate in some way, um, you know, through whatever mechanisms, you know, work for your group, um, that that's the key to it, isn't it? You know, um, and, um, you know, just ensuring that everyone feels you know everyone feels good and they're enjoying the game that's why we're all gathered together if we weren't doing that why why are we gathering together you know if we, we can if we want to scare ourselves without the game framework we can go and take a walk in the woods at two in the morning or whatever we want to do Ooh, uh, i've done that a few we've times to, <laughs> we've chosen to uh gather together in a social kind of environment to play a cool game whatever it may be and have fun and so um you know use whatever tools there's many tools out there. They're all freely available. There's loads of advice about it. If you're unsure, just put in consent in gaming into Google and you will find the information you need. But, um, but ultimately it is about, you know, communicating, understand, you know, the players understanding what you're trying to do with the game and you understanding what the players are looking for from the game. And as long as you kind of, kind of meet in the middle somewhere, um, you, you all hopefully are going to have a great time. And that's, you know, that's why we do it. 
I, I just want to mention, I think that it's when you have a group that you have played with a long time, you, have, you, you tend to know each other and then you know sort of, but I still think it's good talking about it. But, but I think that it's especially important if you're just like playing anything with strangers, then just go for one of the rules. It's like, what is okay? What is not okay? And you can have an X card and say, if it's too much, just stop it. So we, we have a question in there that I think we've actually managed to answer during the during the course of the game, which is uh, what? how would you isolate the characters if your players have a never split them a car party mechanic? And I, I think, Seth and Petter, you were pretty much saying that with it doesn't matter if they don't separate, you know, so long as there's still the mystery and there's a sense of powerlessness um, above and beyond, you know, we can we can do the can do the tactical thing one of the things that i would like to discuss is sort of the the if we we are running over time so if you do have to go let me know um the aftermath um how do you wind do, there's two two aspects to an aftermath really is one is sort of the the in-game um relaxation part of it and the other is sort of bringing the players down after the game do you, do you make a point of having allowing time for a, um a denouement scene and an aftermath scene a, a, a an epilogue um to let people go out on a more relaxed note um uh, petter do you want to lead off on that one uh, it depends completely on the on the story and how it ends i would say if it's a one shot or if it's a campaign I think that for the players, if not the player characters, I think that after the session, you have like the normal time when you're picking things together and you're talking and joking and, and all that. So you have sort of the, the natural um, end there. It depends completely on the campaign. Sometimes you want to have an epilogue on the characters. If everyone is dead, well, then it's easy. <laughs> then you can have an epilogue about their relatives, perhaps. And then the real game started. Yeah. You're all dead. That's where that's when things began. Yeah. <laughs> Seth, um, I completely agree. It depends on what the 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 game is and and the different aspects to it. Because if you want to end it on a uh, uh, a, a good stroke of horror, if you want to have the, the 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 Texas Chainsaw Massacre ending, it is. You know the, the the villain is out there doing some sort of weird dance with a chainsaw in the morning sunrise, and and you're 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 it's like it's still out there or the uh, the nightmare in Elm Street. You know the 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 top comes down on the on the car and oh my god we're in a dream and then cut to black. Uh, that works because then your your day du ma is the the same as the end of a movie. It's the friends walking out of a theater and, and laughing and commenting about it. And that's actually what your wind down is. But if you want to end it with, the, you know, then your characters go on and do this. And then we kind of have a, a nice closure to their story and sort of a happy ending. That just depends on what the game is about and what everybody likes and how things went. Because you can plan on it going one way and then it goes totally a different way. It, that's just fine. One of, one of my favorite endings of a science fiction short story is Arthur C. Clarke, who ends, ends with, and slowly overhead, one by one, the stars were going out. Um, ooh, <laughs> um, Mike, do you, you, any strong feelings on a, on a denouement or a, a wind down or? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what my colleagues have just said exactly the same thing. It depends, but uh, in a one shot, I've tend I've, I've often used some kind of um, brief kind of epilogue per character, whether that's me saying what happened to them, uh, which sometimes might be you know you you know the, your screams are still being heard from the you know the cell door or whatever it may be, or I get the player if they if they they you know it's clear that they've got an idea of what would be cool to how their character ends up or it's some horrible situation, then you know we go around the table and we all do a little kind of mini epilogue. I think that works really well in campaigns because the players have been that invested in their characters and in the plot that give the give each player a chance to kind of, you know, say what happened the following day. I, I, I sometimes see what happened next week and then but and then then tell me what happened 10 years later. Tell me what the effects were 10 years later. And they kind of give a kind of a very brief summary of their their life post this horrific thing that they've been involved in for so long. And that that that's that's that tends to be quite a useful um, way to kind of 
bring things to a natural kind of close. Um, and if it's in the middle of a campaign, then you know we have a character development phase and they roll their ticks and they go all excited about how many skill points they're going to spend on or what equipment they're going to buy. And, you know, that's a great kind of, um, you know, way to decompress as well. So it just depends on what, what you know, the situation is, really. Gentlemen, we are over time by about 10 minutes. And I do want to take a couple of minutes just to thank you for your insights. Um, I said at the start of this that I don't feel that I'm a particularly good um, horror GM, even though I've been GMing for, for decades. Um, I think you've reassured me that there's no special um, magic formula to which I'm, I'm unaware um, that might help, and that really it is just bring all your all your gaming bag of tricks to the table. Um, and I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insights. Um, just to just to recap, I was making some notes as we went along. Um, so I, um, looking at um, for the app, horror is the, the fear of the unknown. Um, build up the atmosphere in game uh, with slow tension and a, a feeling of, of powerlessness uh, for the for the characters. Um, that there should be consequences to all actions. Um, and um, a technique, I, I call it little clouds. Um, some people call it Chekhov's gun, uh, but Mike was saying it, the three warnings. Um, let people know that the, the big scene is, is, is coming. Give those, give those earlier, um, earlier hints that something bad is going to happen there, um, and I think that those those techniques there will get you a long way. Um, so, gentlemen, thank you very much for your insights. Um, Petter, your um, your game, um, Cult Divinity Lost, is currently on Bundle of Holding, um, where people can get PDFs of the game and a number of its supplements um, as a job lot. Is it not? Yes, uh, so you can get it for a good price. And I also want to say that on our homepage, cultdivinityloss.com, you can also you can also download um, 10 quick play scenarios with pre-made characters. And if you just want to look at it and see like what kind of game is this, so you can have all kinds of scenarios from survival horror to family dinners with dream beings and or meeting the messiah and ending the world so a bit of everything i would say mike people can find out more about call of cthulhu simply by sticking that into google really, well, pretty can't much they? yeah um, but i mean you know if you want to be sure just go to chaosium.com uh, and uh, you'll find all your uh, you'll find the the well to dive into the hidden depths of uh, not only call of cthulhu but you know rune quest pen dragons seven six uh, some C and so forth, all, all our mini games, but uh, but there's a plethora of kind of Call of Cthulhu stuff. You can download a free quick start in the scenario, uh, and then you know whatever we've got going, join our mailing list and all the rest of it, or just check us out on Facebook or Twitter. You'll soon find out what we're up to. And I and I will, even though I'm a designer for a different company, say that that for decades Chaosium has been a hallmark of quality and creativity in gaming. Uh, we are all us. Indeed. Um, <laughs> Seth, you've got a you've got a YouTube channel where you explore matters horrific. Um, can you let us know what that is? Um, well, it's it's under the highly imaginative name Seth Skorkowski. Uh Everybody else had these these brilliant little names for their YouTube channels. I just stuck my name there, and uh, I occasionally look at that and go, "That was probably a poor idea." So. My name, which is very difficult to spell for most people, so that was also a good move on my part. <laughs> so, um, and there I do talk about horror gaming philosophy. I do reviews for lots of different games. And then just sometimes I just do goofy, goofy videos because that was the mood I was in. So it's, and you've got it's, novels as well, so so branding yourself yes. by your name is actually quite a good idea if you want to link in the novel sales with that, that was 
that was the original intent and and then the the youtube thing ended up kind of cresting past my my novelist side and now it became i'm i'm a youtuber that also writes novelists and it was supposed to be i'm a novelist that also does <laughs> gaming youtube so well uh, <laughs> i would ask you how that feels but i'm not sure we're ready for quite that much horror <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen thank you very much for your time it's been a marvelous panel and thank you for being such good guests thank you for sharing your insights and uh thank you those of you who've attended and asked questions uh, for our panel um we'll see you at the next con whether it be held in the ether or whether it be face to face post covid restrictions thank you everyone thank you.